Hello, everyone. This is the 56th episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles, and I'm joined by Paul from Shipley in England. For this episode, we started a new interview series with Spanish author and historian, Mr. Sergio Villarino Ferreiro, as we discuss the matches of the Spanish national team during the 1982-83 season. Mr. Villarino is the author of Mexico 70, 50 años de football and color. Hello, Jan. Hello, Paul. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Sergio. Could you just start off by telling us about your first football memories and your involvement with the game since? Oh, uh, I think my first football memory uh, is watching the last uh, moments of the best years of La Quinta del Buitre, the Real Madrid team. I became a, a Madridista because of Hugo Sanchez and, and Bernd Schuster, who were my, my, favorite, uh, my favorite players. So uh, since then, I, I've been following the, the team and following football. In all, all its, its variants, I've been playing and, and, and coaching, uh, even when I was in the, in the U.S., so, uh, yeah, it's my, my biggest passion, I think, among others. But that's basically, that's basically it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we start off with the 1982-83 season. We start off in the fall of 1982, following the World Cup that Spain had hosted. Spain, as host of the 1982 World Cup, had been a disappointment. Yeah. Much was expected of his team, but the pressure as hosts perhaps got to Spain. In fact, at the time, their performance was one of the worst by a host nation in the World Cup history. I mean, we have to remember that the previous hosts in 1974 and 1978 had actually won the World Cup. After the World Cup, Jose Santa Maria gave way as manager to be replaced by his former teammate and manager at Real Madrid, Miguel Munoz. Miguel Munoz had been a player and later a manager of Real Madrid's great side of the late 50s and the early 1960s. He had amazingly been Real Madrid's manager from 1960 to 1974. His first task was to rebuild the demoralized side and help Spain qualify to the 1984 Euros to take place in France. Spain were in a group with Holland, Republic of Ireland, Iceland, and Malta. So they were essentially in a three-way fight for one place with Holland and Republic of Ireland as their main rivals. This 1982-83 season was well underway before Spain would play their first match and their first qualifier on October 27th at Malaga versus Iceland. For this match, Miguel Munoz selected the following squad for his very first match. Capping the side, goalkeeper Luis Arconada, of Real Sociedad. Jose Antonio Camacho of Real Madrid. Making his international debut, Juan Jose of Real Madrid, also nicknamed Sandokan, like the literary character, yes. because of his long hair and beard. Yeah. Another debutant, another Real Madrid player, Francisco Bonnet. Then you have Gerardo of Barcelona. So that's the defense. Yet another debutant, Juan Senor of Real Zaragoza. Another debutant, Roberto Fernandez of Valencia. Then you have Rafael Gordillo of Betis. And he'd be replaced by another debutant, Francisco of Sevilla in the 46th minute. Another debutant, Juan Pedraza of Atletico Madrid. And he'll be replaced by another debutant, Martin of Osasuna in the 81st minute. 
up front you have Carlos Santiana of Real Madrid and Marcos Alonso of Barcelona. In all, you have seven debutants. Juan Jose, Bonet, Roberto, Senor, Francisco, Pedraza, and Martin. And quickly going over the Iceland lineup. You have Thorsten Bjarnason of IBK, Orn Oskarsson of IBV, Savar Johnson of Circle Bruges in Belgium, capping the side Martin Gerson of Fram Reykjavik, Vidar Haldorson of FH, Omar Torfason of Viking Gur Reykjavik, Atli Edvalson of Fortuna Dusseldorf in West Germany, Arnor Gudjonsson of Lokeren in Belgium, father of Eidur Gudjonsson, Arni Sveinsson of IA Akrans, he'll be replaced by Heimir Carlson of Viking Gur Reykjavik in the 64th minute. Sigurdur Gretarsson of Breidalik, he'd be replaced by Gunnar Gislason of KA in the 78th minute. And Petur Petursson of Antwerp of Belgium, side managed by Johannes Atlaso. For this match, Spain would win 1 0. The debutant Pedraza, after a series of passes on the right side, Juan Jose's ground level cross was shot in by Pedraza. Spain won 1 0 for their first qualifier. Also, just to mention that Gerardo, this would be his last match for Spain until 1985. A minimum win for Spain. But I'm sure most people expected a bigger margin of victory, though the takeaway, I guess, are just so many debutants for Spain. Yes, it was, a, as, you, as you said, it was a difficult time for, for the national team. We went, the, uh, it was just after the, the failure of the, of the World Cup and, and it was a, a, a big disappointment for, for, the, you know, for the Spanish football community because we were expecting so much from the from the team in the in the World Cup and, and it was a it was a disaster as you said uh, we were I think the worst host nation until that moment so it was not the people was not happy it was kind of surprising that uh, Miguel Muñoz at that time the, the winningest Spanish coach took over and uh, basically the first thing he did was just rebuild the team he got rid of most of the squad of the World Cup and he just started giving opportunities to, to young players. Young players who were already in the youth system of the national team, which was set in place by Santa Maria and it was really difficult for any player who was not in that youth system to, to come and, and get a place in the, in the national team. So, as you said, six, six debutants and this first game was supposed, yes, it is difficult because they are new players, but it was Iceland. And Iceland was not what it is today. It was supposed to, you know, receive a good amount of goals by the by by Spain, but it was not like that. Especially the first half is not good. But in the second half, the presence of Francisco gave Spain a new a new edge. He man and uh, Juan Jose controlled the, the midfield. They created, they they set in place what it was going to be a second half of, of a lot of chances for Spain, culminated in the, in the goal by, by Pedraza. But it is a, a really short uh, score for what uh, we saw in the, second, in the second half. Probably Spain deserved, uh, deserved more. But 1-0, and uh, it was a, a, at least a good way to, to start the, the route to France 84. The most noticeable casualties of the new Miguel Munoz era were Juanito of yes. Real Madrid, Jesus Zamora of Sociedad, I guess Miguel Tendio of Valencia, and Saura as well. So those yeah. are the more noticeable players who were discarded by yeah, Miguel Munoz. Tendio was really young, and he was, he was called at the beginning. He was in the initial squad, but he got injured. Same as Camacho and, uh, and Santillana. That's why they, they didn't play. But the video was like 21 at that, at that moment. He was a, a really good defender. He was still considered 
to be around in the orbit of the of the national the national team. The rest, yes, they basically disappeared. Juanito was uh, it was a good player, but his character was not easy. And during yeah. the World Cup, he had some some issues, some some problems with Lucas Farte, for example. And uh, during the game against, I think it was Yugoslavia, and Munoz, who knew him obviously from from coaching Real Madrid and, and knowing him because he, he was a very well known player at the time, he didn't want to to deal with it. Strange that there weren't any friendly matches played before this, that all the new players were coming straight into a competitive game. I'm sure that now there would be at least one friendly match at the start of the season to integrate some of those players. Yeah, sure. The The problem is that the, the first game is basically two months, two months and a half after the end of the World Cup. So my guess is that there was a long contract with Santa Maria, Probably his contract till the moment he it was terminated. It took a while. Our the president of the of the federation was a very peculiar man, <laughs> and I'm sure that it was not as straightforward as we uh, we are thinking. The, like switching from Santa Maria to 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 Munoz. So probably Miguel Munoz was just you know thrown into the sharks of that uh, qualifying campaign in October. But when well, he was he was very experienced. He had dealt with Real Madrid for 14 seasons, which is something that is, uh, even, is amazing <laughs> nowadays. So he was ready for that. The following month, on November 17th, Spain played their second qualifier and first away trip at Dublin at Lansdowne Road. And we actually discussed this match for our Republic of Ireland podcast. For this match on November 17th, Munoz selected the following squad. Luis Arconada of Real Sociedad in goal, captaining the side. Camacho of Real Madrid. Juan Jose of Real Madrid. Bonnet of Real Madrid. Antonio Maceda of Sporting Gijón. Juan Senor of Real Zaragoza. Victor of Barcelona. Rafael Gordillo of Betis. Marcos Alonso of Barcelona, Juan Pedraza of Atletico Madrid, and he replaced by Martin of Osasuna in the 76th minute, Carlos Santiana of Real Madrid, and he replaced by Roberto Fernandez of Valencia in the 81st minute. And quickly going through the Republic of Ireland squad, we have Seamus McDonough of Bolton Wonders. John Devine of Arsenal, Mick Martin of Newcastle, Mark Lawrenson of Liverpool, Chris Hewton of Tottenham, captaining the side Tony Grealish of Brighton. He replaced by Mickey Walsh of Porto in Portugal in the 60th minute. Liam Brady uh, of Sampdoria in Italy, Ashley Grimes of Manchester United, Kevin O'Callaghan of Ipswich. Frank Stapleton of Manchester United and Michael Robinson of Brighton. And of course, Spanish fans remember him as a future Osasuna player. Yeah. Osasuna player, mainly TV star. He was, yes, uh, of course. Yeah. Of, of football, really, in Spain. And side and managed star. by Owen Hand. This match would end up as an entertaining 3 3 tie. That at one point looked like Spain were going to get away with the win away from home. Ireland took the lead in the second minute when Ashley Grimes struck a long range shot from the edge of the box at the top right hand corner. Spain tied a match. Santiana took a free kick from the left side and Maceda was left unmarked on the right side. He just volleyed it in. Early in the second half in the 47th minute, Victor released Senor on the right side. His angled shot was deflected in by Mick Martin. In the 60th minute, Spain took a 3-1 lead. When Marco sent Victor through, who went around McDonough to score the third goal. Just four minutes later, Ireland pulled the goal back. Brady took a free kick from the left side, and Frank Stapleton scored with a header on the near post. Stapleton would 
scored another header in the 76th minute from the same location, more or less. Uh, this time from O'Callaghan's cross from the right side. Spain came away with an away tie. Looking ahead to what would happen the following season, it could have been a costly point dropped, even though I'm sure at the time, any away point against one of their rivals would have been a welcome point. It was, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, for what I'm seeing, it was, uh, it left a bit of sweet taste in the, in the mouth of the team because they were winning 3-1. And the, the game was a tough one. Uh, it was, re- there were just really hard tackles flying one way and the other because the, the, the Spanish players at that moment, they were rough, on the edges, but but the, the the Irish ones were were also, and especially uh, Stapleton and Robinson, uh, the forwards from the Irish team, they were really really going hard against the defenders. What we seen here is that what well, we saw or, already things that signs for the future, like the Maceda goal, right, coming for a free kick and appearing alone in the in the box and, and scoring something that we're going to see in the in the tournament, right, in the, in the Euro 84. And we are seeing already, again, a, a young team that is surviving difficult circumstances. So I guess the process no, was, uh, was going well, but the feeling at the moment was probably not, uh, not good because uh, there were problems inside the Federation. The press was always really, really tough especially on the president of the federation that is going to resign soon after, I think a couple, a couple of years later. And, and yeah, I mean, yes, extra point that we, that we won on the road, but I think a, a, a victory was almost, uh, almost done. And by the end, those two goals of, of Stapleton deprived us from, from it. So I don't know if, me, if Munoz was really, really happy with that. We should mention that this will be the second and final caps for both Pedraza and Martin. Yes. And as far as Roberto, he would be out of contention. His next match for Spain, believe it or not, would be as a substitute in the Euro 1984 final against France. Yes. So he would be out of the Spain team. And in fact, I think... He was called up maybe as a last minute to cover for injuries for the 1984 Euro side. For all intents and purposes, he was out of the squad. He's an interesting player because he, he was on the you know, around the, the, the national team for a while. He, yeah. he went to the 1990 World Cup, uh, yes. but he was in, a, in and out continuously. He was really young at this, at this moment. He was like a creative midfielder at the time and Spain didn't have that many creative midfielders at the, at the moment we were still La Furia right the, the, the theory we were more like a like a kind of hard hard tackling team at that yes. moment and which is we, we've come a long way but, but at that moment yes he was considered a player who was able to just create create the, the play same as Francisco or same as, as Senor Roberto he would have his best period with Luis Suarez as manager in the yeah. post-1988 era into the 1990. He would be a starter. By then, he was a Barcelona player mm-hmm. uh, at that point. As far as the other, we see Victor is back in the lineup. And, of course, he would remain for the rest of Miguel Munoz's tenure until 1988. And Maceda back in the squad. But... As far as Pedraza and Martin, the experimentation with those two was over, as far as yeah. Miguel Munoz. As far as the newcomers, it looks like one senior would have the most lasting effect within the team. Yeah, he was a Zaragoza player, a creative, creative midfielder who was able to play in the center, on the right, and even as a, as a libero, he, he will play as a libero later in his career. And yeah, he's going to become like the creative fulcrum of the national of the national team. He's going to become a key player for the rest for the next maybe four four years, at least till the World Cup in in Mexico. So yes, he's going to become a, an important one. 
And his most significant contribution was, I guess, scoring the. He scored a 12th goal, right, against he, Malta. He but that's, yeah, that's for next season. That's a whole different yes. discussion. Yeah. So <laughs> that was as far as the year 1982 for Spain. That was a forgettable year overall for the national team. We come to the year 1983. For his first match of the year on February 16th, Spain at Sevilla are hosting the Netherlands. And again, we discussed this match in our Netherlands podcast as well. For this match, Miguel Munoz selected the following squad. Again, capping the side, Luis Arconada of Real Sociedad in goal. Juan Jose of Real Madrid. Antonio Maceda of Sporting Gijón, Jose Camacho of Real Madrid, making his international debut, the butcher of Bilbao, Andoni Goicochea of Athletic Bilbao, Victor of Barcelona, Juan Senor of Zaragoza, Rafael Gordillo of Betis, Francisco Carrasco of Barcelona. Another debutant from Athletic Bilbao, Manuel Sarabia up front. He'd be replaced by Ricardo Gallego of Real Madrid in the 87th minute and Marcos Alonso of Barcelona. The national debuts of Goicoche and Sarabia are significant because Bilbao would be Spanish champions that season. Yes, and this is the, the first uh, season uh, with uh, Athletic Bilbao as, as champions of Spain. They are going to win the next one too, uh, just making the do- doing the double uh, with under Javier Clemente. And yes, uh, some of, of uh, their players are going to become stalwarts of, of the national team. Goicochea is going to be a reference in the center of the defense. He's maligned, I would say. <laughs> In, in England, but in Spain, yes, he was a really, really tough defender, but he was, a, he was able to play the, the ball. He was a, a good central defender, and he's paired with, with Maceda, and he's going to be really good. Sarabia was uh, technically very gifted. He was really, really, really good. He, he could play as a, even as a false nine, and uh, he's going to become like, a, like the, the joker. Of, of the team in, in attack. He can start, he can come from the bench and create chances. So uh, he's going to become important for Munoz. His character is not easy e- either. So he's going to create some problems, not in this cycle, but uh, later for the, for the World Cup in, in, in Mexico, same as Rincón, who will we will talk about him. The next uh, and the other player that is going to become really, really important is Carrasco. Carrasco is a is a winger from from Barcelona. Really skilled. He he loved to to dribble, and he was always a, a, a great outlet. Uh, when the team didn't know what to do, they give the, the ball to, to Carrasco, and he was able to create create things. And so yes, but this this game was was really difficult because the Netherlands even when they were just basically in the middle of a change of the guard, right? From the great team from the 70s to what was going to become the, the European champions of 88. And they dominated for one hour, really, at least uh, on the game. But the last 15 minutes of, of each, each half, if you look at just at, at, at those, those periods, Spain looked like a world-class team. Senor was really, really good. And in the end, he was going to to become the, the key player because he's going to, to score the winning goal. But Marcos, Goicochea, Sarabia, Gordillo, they were all really active, really, really active. And I think the general consensus after this game was like, well, maybe we can we can get there. Maybe we can get to France. We can beat the, the Dutch. The Dutch in theory were the, the strongest team in the, in the group or the strongest support. So I think this left a much better taste in our mouth and then the game at, at Ireland. Quickly going over the Dutch side managed by Keith Rivers. You have Pete Shrivers of Ajax in goal. 
Capping the side, Ben Weinstecker's of Feyenoord. Ruud Kroll of Napoli in Italy. I believe this was his final cap for Holland. Ronald Spelbos of Club Brugge in Belgium. Peter Boev of Ajax. Michel van der Korput of Torino in Italy. John Metgott of Real Madrid. He'd yes. be replaced by Michel Valk of Feyenoord in the 72nd minute. Dick Schonacker of Ajax, Hugo Hovenkamp of AZ 67 of Alkmaar. He'd be replaced by Ruth Hullet of Feyenoord in the 46th minute. Yuri Kulhov of PSV Eindhoven and Rene van der Heip of Lokeren in Belgium. As far as the match, as you mentioned, it'd be settled by one senior's penalty kick in the 43rd minute. Pete Shrivers fouled Carrasco in the box and one senior scored from the spot to give Spain the win. Very key win against, like you said, their main rivals. Again, the main takeaway would be the debut of Goiko Chea, who would be a mainstay of the national team at least until 1987, I believe. That may have been his last cap before he would join Atletico Madrid. Yeah, he, he will have he will have injury problems, same as Mafeda. I think his central center back pairing probably would have last till probably 1990, but they were having a lot of trouble with injuries, and in the end, their their career were their careers were cut short by by that, yes. especially Mafeda. Yes, we should mention Mafeda would join Real Madrid for the 85-86 season. And he would have a very good season, but towards the end of the season, just before the World Cup, he would suffer an injury and he would rarely play after that. He would still be on the fringes, but he would rarely play again after that. Yeah, he's Um, not going to to play really anymore. I mean, uh, he's going to retire, I think, three seasons after, but really he's not going to to play anymore. That, That injury basically ended. Uh, right, creating a huge problem for Real uh, Madrid. He was the center back for the next five years, and yeah. suddenly he disappeared. And Real Madrid started just buying new center backs that were not good enough. Uh, until Fernando Hierro arrived from from Valladolid, that was not that was that problem was not solved. Next match for Spain is on April twenty seventh at Zaragoza. This is a return fixture against the Republic of Ireland. For this match, Munoz selects the following squad. Capping the side again, Luis Arconada in goal of Real Sociedad, Juan Jose of Real Madrid, Antonio Maceda of Sporting Gijón, Bonet of Real Madrid, Jose Camacho of Real Madrid, Victor of Barcelona, he replaced by Ricardo Gallego of Real Madrid in the 46th minute. Juan Senor of Zaragoza. Rafael Gordillo of Betis. Marcos Alonso of Barcelona. Carlos Santiana of Real Madrid. Francisco Carrasco of Barcelona. And he will be replaced by international debutant. Hippolito Rincon of Betis in the 74th minute. Quickly going through the Irish lineup, you have Seamus McDonough of Bolton Wanderers, Mark Lawrenson of Liverpool, David O'Leary of Arsenal, Mick Martin of Newcastle, Chris Hewton of Tottenham, Ronnie Whelan of Liverpool, he replaced by Jerry Daly of Coventry City in the 77th minute, capping the side Tony Grealish of Brighton, Gary Waddock of Queen's Park Rangers. Ashley Grimes of Manchester United. He'll be replaced by Kevin O'Callaghan of Ipswich Town in the 57th minute. Frank Stapleton of Manchester United. And Mickey Walsh of Porto in Portugal. Side managed by Owen Hand. This match, Spain would win 2-0. Another significant win against a close rival. Santiana would open the scoring in the 51st minute. A cross from the right side led to misunderstanding between O'Leary and McDonough, and Santiana just sneaked through and scored with a header. 
just before the end of the match in the 89th minute, there was a free kick on the right side and it was headed in the near post by the international debutant Rincon. Very important win for Spain. And like you said, after the win against Holland, this is another win where I'm sure the Spanish press felt like, yes, they, can, they may be able to qualify from this group. We should also mention that this was the fourth and the last cap for Juan Jose, also known as Sandokan. Yeah, so, yeah. He's, he's, uh, this is the, his, last, uh, his last game with the, uh, with the team. Uh, this is a very important win uh, because after this, uh, Spain was traveling to Malta and uh, Iceland. So in theory, four points uh, should come out of those, those games. And Holland had to deal with the with the Irish. So, if Spain had won this 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 game, well, he they were going to be very well placed in the group. Fortunately for the national team, they won. It was a, a tough one, but not only it was important because of the two points, but also for the debuts of important players for the whole of the cycle, especially Oli Rincon who is going to, to become one of the important strikers, uh, the leaders of the, the attack during this period with Carrasco, with Santillana, with Sarabia. And obviously we are seeing that as you are just, you know, going through the, through the team, we are getting closer and closer to the, to the squad that is going to go all the way to the final of the, of the Euro 84. In the end, Santillana opened the score uh, with uh, one of his trademark headers. And it was important for Rincon to make his debut and score in, in Zaragoza because uh, Spain is going to play in Sevilla a lot from now on. And he was an idol there. He was the leading scorer of, of Betis. So it was important for the, for the national team to have somebody who was you know, a link with, uh, with the stadium where they were playing. Speaking of Hippolito Rincon, Rincon had been a Real Madrid product, but he never made it there. And he had to find his way to the top from Betis. And he's one of the many strikers that for obvious reasons, because of such competition at Real Madrid, are unable to find their way. And we can mention other players as well throughout history who just couldn't break out of Ram, like Sebastian or Lozada. We can go yes. on and on. Maybe Ismail Uzais and others. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, more so, recently, Roberto Soldado. Or yes. Or yes. Uh, plenty of them. Morata. Even. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, Hippolito Rincon, like you said, he was very prolific with Betis. And his bad luck was he potentially would have been Spain's starting striker for the 1984 Euros and the 1986 World Cup, but he got injured for both just ahead of the tournaments. Correct. And, yeah. and, uh, at the same time, he was injured and a young kid from Real Madrid appeared and this kid took yes. over, which was Emilio, Emilio Butragueño just after the, the Euro 84 uh, tournament. But he was still an important, an important player, player who was a constant present in the in the national team, oh, but he was not going to be the leading figure of the attack. That we were supposed he was going to, to be. What we were thinking was going to happen when Santillana retires. He was already a uh, veteran. Well, we had Rincon, you know, as a reference, but he was not very fortunate with with injuries, and at the same time, uh, the, the appearance of, of Butzarini to stop his, his development really as, a, as the national team strike. We're seeing the last couple of games that Ricardo Gallego is also getting back into the squad. He's also a Real Madrid legend yes. who would be part of the glorious team of the 80s, eventually end up at Udinese. At yes. yes. He's still a player who, who was able to play as a midfield creative uh, player or also as a center back or leader so yes he was very very useful he, he's going to spend some important games playing as a center back because spain didn't have that many quality center backs and with the injuries of 
with Bochan and, and Maceda, he's going to play there a lot during the Euros, during the, the World Cup in Mexico. So before we move on to the away games, Sergio, could you just say something about this um, policy of playing the home games outside of Barcelona and Madrid and generally in the smaller cities? Was that to create a better atmosphere in smaller stadiums, do you think, for these these qualifiers? It was a policy that continued for quite a long time. Yeah, we are we are still basically doing it, just going around yeah. uh, going around the country uh, because uh, I think uh, here is seen as, as the way to keep the, the national team closer to everybody. Obviously, the national team was not going to Barcelona, was not going to Bilbao for <laughs> political reasons. Madrid was still... Probably the fresh memories of the World Cup were playing against the against the Bernabeu or maybe the Calderon, and in the end, playing the, the the national team is going to find their place in Sevilla. They're going to play normally in Sevilla for the next decade, more or less, yes. especially in the Villa Marín or, or Sánchez Pizjuán, right? And because the the environment there is it is, it is perfect. People is really passionate about the national team. And well, it was difficult to to go to those places. Really, uh, the stadiums that are not small, not huge, but people is really close to the to the pitch, and the atmosphere is it, it was really good. It was he, they were pushing the, the national team. So uh, in the end, I think uh, during this qualifying campaign, they, they found their their place in in Sevilla. Eventually, they able to play everywhere else, especially if it's a uh, Friendly, but the most important games are going to be played. It's worth noting that Spain would be undefeated in Sevilla from 1923 till 1991 when they lost yes. to France. So Sevilla is their unofficial lucky ground. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Even for these last Euros, uh, Spain played the, the first group stage in, in Sevilla. The, that was the, uh, the our stadium, the stadium that we sent, you know, as a as a C for for um, for the national for the national team for this last year or so. And that's a special place for 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 Spain. We're nearing the end of the season, and as you mentioned, in the month of May, Spain has two away trips against Malta and Iceland that at this point are seen as formalities. Yeah. On May 15th, Spain traveled to Malta at Valletta's Takali Stadium. Incidentally, Spain protested playing in that stadium because you have to remember the history of Malta Stadium before they used to have the Gazira Stadium, which was just dust, no grass, if you remember that. They had to build a new stadium that was also, at this point, not up to scratch for international football. So Mm -hmm. the Dutch were able to arrange Malta's home match at Eichen in West Germany. Mm -hmm. And Spain protested the fact that they had to play Malta at Malta. Yeah. Uh, but the match went ahead on May 15th. For this match, we have the following Spain squad. Luis Arconada, captain of the side from Real Sociedad. Francisco Bonet of Real Madrid. He replaced by Andoni Goicochea of Bilbao in the 58th minute. Antonio Maceda of Sporting Gijón. Jose Antonio Camacho of Real Madrid. Juan Senor of Zaragoza, Rafael Gordillo of Betis, Victor of Barcelona, Ricardo Gallego of Real Madrid, Marcos Alonso of Barcelona, he'll be replaced by Hippolito Rincon of Betis in the 46th minute, Carlos Santiana of Real Madrid, and Francisco Carrasco of Barcelona. Quickly going to the Malta lineup, you have John Bonello of Hibernians, Edwin Farugia of Hamrun Spartans, Emmanuel Farugia of Valletta, Emmanuel Fabri of Sliema Wanderers, Captain Gisad Mario Shembri of Sliema Wanderers, Norman Budijic of Hibernians, 
Carmel Busutil of Rabat Ajax, Silvio De Manuel of Floriana, Ernest Piteri Gonzi of Hibernians, Joseph Gigi Salerno of Hamron Spartans, and Michael De Giorgio of Hamron Spartans, side managed by Victor Sherry. We should mention that this was also the fourth and the last cap for Bonnet. And he would be out of contention from Munoz's squads. Another significant event in this match was that Luis Arconada tied Jose Iribar's record of 49 caps for Spain. And that number is laughable that that was considered a record number at that point. Yes. <laughs> as far as the match itself, one senior gave Spain the lead with a free kick in the 23rd minute. Carmel Busutil tied the match in the 30th minute and scored a second goal for Malta in the 47th minute. Carrasco tied the match in the 60th minute and just five minutes before the end, Rafael Gordillo scored the winner. It was not an easy match for Spain, but they came away with the points. Yeah, you see, it, it was really difficult, as you said, because mainly because of the, the type of surface they were playing. It, were, it, it was like being on, on the beach already. It was the end of the season, and it was just a field or a beach. It just was dirt and very regular, very difficult to, to play. I don't know if, if that's an excuse. The difference in between Spain and Malta at that moment was, was huge in terms of football level. But in the end, on that day, it was really difficult. And Spain you know, was able to scrap and uh, come home with two points. But it was not, it was not, not easy. Fortunately, uh, Gordillo, Senor, played a, a, a good game. They scored. But the defense was a problem. Probably that, that's one of the reasons why Bonnet never came back. Spain set up uh, an offensive 11 because they were supposed to win and to win well with, for a certain difference and get that goal difference up. And, so, and they found that that day the, the defense were not playing well. They were behind as far as the 49th minute. And I, I'm, I'm sure that at that moment Munoz was fuming. And, and scratching names from, from his lists. Fortunately, we got the, the two points, but they, uh, it cost a lot for some of the members of, of that team. We should remember that the Republic of Ireland also had a very difficult game in Malta in that campaign. Yes. And only, only scored at the very end as well. Obviously, a, a very difficult place to play football at that time. Yes. It was a huge advantage for the for the Netherlands they, to be able to play Malta in even if it's war, it, it was in Germany, it was a it was a football beach and not, yes. and not a beach football beach. So <laughs> it is okay. One one trivia question is that a lot of the players who play for Spain here in Malta this, this game, they are going to become like the the pioneers of beach football in Spain. They're going to play for the national team, like Guardia, for example. So <laughs> Maybe they they they, even, they 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 liked it and they, they became <laughs> they became used to it. So difficult away trip, but the minimum requirement was to win. And again, when you think how this group ended, it's amazing that all these points count. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Two weeks later, on May 29th, another away trip. <laughs> This time at Reykjavik for the return fixture against Iceland. For this match, Luis Arconada would earn his 50th cap and become the new record holder for appearances for Spain. Mm -hmm. So you, he, you have him capping the side. You have one senior of Zaragoza, Antonio Maceda of Sporting Gijón, Andoni Goicochea of Athletic Bilbao, now firmly established in the defense with Bonnet Gun, Jose Antonio Camacho of Real Madrid, Victor of Barcelona, Ricardo Gallego of Real Madrid, Rafael Gordillo of Betis, Francisco Carrasco of Barcelona, Carlos Santiana of Real Madrid, 
He'd be replaced by Manuel Sarabia of Athletic Bilbao in the 89th minute and Hippolito Rincon of Betis. Going quickly through the Iceland lineup, you have Thorsen Bjarnason of IBK, Vidar Haldorson of FH, Savar Johnson of Circle Bruges, Belgium, Sigurdur Larusson of IA, Olafur Bjornosson of Breidalek, Gunnar Gislason of KA, he replaced by Arnis Sveinsson of IA Akrans in the 55th minute. Capping the side, Janus Goodluckson of FH, Arnor Gudjunsson of Lokeren in Belgium, Ragnar Margersson of Circle Bruges in Belgium, Larus Gudmundsson of Watershai in Belgium, Petur Peterson of Antwerp in Belgium, and he'd be replaced by Omar Torfason of Vikingu Reykjavik in the 46th minute, the side managed by Johannes Atlasson. We noticed that one senior played in defense. I guess after the match against Malta, it seemed like Munoz was experimenting with senior in defense. Yeah, he played as a right back also against against Malta for for a while. He he's going to every time Spain wanted to attack, senior was going to move to to right back because it was a a way for. To having him in the squad because you don't need four defenders for this type of of game and every time he was receiving the ball or Spain had the ball Senor was going to advance and he could act as a, a, a right back right or he could drift inside and, and become a, a central midfielder an extra center center midfielder which was his his uh, usual usual position so it was an advantage a, a tactical advantage by having Goycoche and Maceda just in the in the middle was more than enough to deal with Malta, although they didn't play there or or Iceland. In this case, in this game, the big problem was was the wind. It was really windy in in Iceland that, that day. I don't know if it's something common there, but it was difficult because the Icelandics were just thumping balls up, and the ball was just drifting away it was it was very difficult to to control and we know that Arconada although he was a great goalkeeper he was he was short so every every ball into the into the box was a was a big deal for for Spain Maceda and and Goicoche had to had to be on top of their game at that moment it was not a good game that's yeah. that's that's for sure but that was the capacity that this Spanish team had like winning even if if they were not playing well, and that happened quite a few times during this qualifying campaign. Just like the very first match of the season, Spain won this match against Iceland 1-0. Mm-hmm. Antonio Maceda scored in the ninth minute and Spain held on to the win. Yes. The season ended with this win and basically Spain played only qualifiers this season no friendly matches six no. of six out of their eight qualifiers were played in this season and other than the point drop at ireland spain had a satisfactory season we can say yes in terms of results for sure as i said outside the strictly footballing issues there was a lot of pressure by the press especially on the on the federation there was turmoil in the institution and i think the fact that spain didn't play any friendly it was part of of the system that was in place at that moment we had the under 21s preparing for the under 21 european championship for the olympic games too the, they were the qualifi- qualifiers of the olympic games so we had uh, Miera and Moreno, who were the, the coaches of, of those youth teams, basically scouting players all over the place and making them, them play. So every time Munoz needed a, a replacement or a new player for, for the A squad, he was calling them not from what he saw during the league campaign, but for the reports that Miera and Moreno were giving him. Okay, I have this under 21 player who is doing really well, he should go up and play for the for the national team. They were playing more or less the same system, so it was easy for the team, for the players who move up and down those teams. During this summer, with all those 
uh, competitions uh, being, being played. There is a list of players under 23 years old who are deemed to be ready to j- jump to the national team if, if needed. Zubiz Arreta is one, one of them. Bullo, who has been Arconada's uh, second goalkeeper for the last games, is also there. Uh, Julio Alberto, left back from, from Barcelona. Chendo, right back from, from Real Madrid. Uh, we have Salva, centre back from Zaragoza. And then Urtubi, Marina and Quique, who are midfielders from Atletico Bilbao and Atletico Madrid. We have Esteban from Sporting Gijón. Roberto is still there going up and down and those teams. And in attack, we have Julio Salinas, who is going to become you know, a mainstay of, of the national team for the next, uh, next years. And also we have Eloy, who is going to become famous uh, during the, the World Cup in, in Mexico. So we have already that group of young players who are going to become important in the national team. They were already under the radar of, of Muñoz because of the system that was in place. So maybe that's an explanation of why the national team didn't play any friendlies. We mentioned that of these newcomers, one senior is the one who seems to be a regular match to match. Yeah. And Sarabia is on the fringes, maybe as, like you said, as an extra cover in attack. Yeah. But it seems like Santiana is, is going to be the starter with maybe Rincon. As far as this season's players, 14 of them would make it to the finals of the Euros. Uh-huh. So it seems like Miguel Munoz already has his ideal lineup in mind. Again, Arconada is going to remain Camacho, Maceda, and Goicocha in defense. Gordillo, Senor, Victor, Gallego, Carrasco, Santiana, Marcos, yeah. and Sarabia. And Francisco is going to be on the fringe. It's always going to be like a fringe player of the yes. squad, Francisco, yes. even up to 1986. We mentioned Roberto, who really was not supposed to be in the 84 Euros, but he makes the squad due to injuries. There seems to be a settled squad, more or less. It's strange because as far as the getting back to Miguel Munoz, as far as his nomination, it seemed like his best days as a manager were past him when he was appointed as national yeah. team manager. So yeah, that, was a, yeah. that must have been surprising at the time. Uh, yeah, I mean, he left Real Madrid in 74, so almost 10 years before he was appointed national team manager. He coached Las Palmas later. And yeah, but he was, I don't know, he was kind of a, a consensus uh, man, like an elder statement. Because at that moment, I don't know how many coaches wanted to be the national, the national team coach. After Spanish 82, I'm not sure uh, that anybody wanted wanted to, to touch the, the national team with a, you know, with a basketball. So he never had any fear. He was mm-hmm. uh, very straightforward, especially with the press. And at that moment, uh, the president of the federation was fighting the press every day. So maybe he wanted, you know, like a sort of, of pit bull on the first line. And he was an experienced coach. He, wa- he had a, a clear idea of how he wanted to play. He wanted to play with a solid defense and then, well, let's see. And this right. is what he's creating during this, during this season. He's trying to find that defensive block that is going to work for him. And then in attack, we'll, we'll find a way because we have decent, good players, right? Apparently, during this season, he used that season for that. He found that block, Guicochea, Maceda, Camacho, right? Gallego and, and uh, in front of the, of the defense, Senor too, right? And, af- and after that, uh, he's going to uh, maintain a certain number of players for, the whole, for his whole cycle till the end of 88. He's lucky because like in the Witcher appears just after the, the Euros, right, in 84, and he had an extra quality uh, coming into the team. But he's going to operate with maybe 20, 25 players maximum. He's not going to call, uh, he's not going to make any revolution once yes. he has his man. As far as his newcomers, 
Juan Jose, Bonet, Pedraza, and Martin, that would be the last you see would see them this season. Those experimentations clearly did not work as far as mm-hmm. he was concerned. Another point, you touched up on it. We can't stress enough uh, how post-1982 World Cup, how negatively that World Cup was viewed in Spain. Also, Spain, just as an aside, Spanish football at this point was not the tiki-taka football. It was considered very violent, very foul-ridden league. Yes. And that was one of the many complaints of Maradona. That was his first season in Spain. Uh, And obviously, the following season, he would get a worse treatment from obviously Goicochea, but nevertheless, even during this season, he would be fouled constantly. His stay in Spain was not a happy one, and it was indicative of the style of Spanish football at that point in time. Yeah, at that, at that moment, as I said before, we were not similar in any point that, that what Spain is now. It was a kind of British game, especially from, from the teams in the north, the Rasputado and the Bilbao, right? And we were playing 4-4-2 with man marker, which was still very, very common in, in Spain, just having one guy just following the best player of the other team on the wing field who was going to the bathroom. A libero who was basically trying to fix any problems that the backline had, but not, not, not in, this, in the same, in, in, the, in the way of, you know, I'm going to come here, get the ball, and, and uh, we forget about it. No, he was going to come and basically keep the man also. So two central midfielders who mostly were defensive midfielders, and then we were just playing with wingers and at least one big man up there. Very uh, high tempo most of the time. It was not. It was not Kitaka, That's 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 for sure. And and, and the and the, the 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 fans they they wanted that. They were expecting that. We want our team to fight. We want our team to sweat the the jersey. And if you can play a little bit more after, that's good. But the sweat part is uh, is not negotiable. I mean, Santiana certainly seems appears to be like a English style forward with good with headers and yeah, he combative. Amazing. amazing, amazing in the air. He was uh, probably the best or one of the best headers uh, of the ball that we've seen in Spain. Probably the best. Zamorano was really good, but but Santiana was something else. Pitches everywhere didn't lend themselves to playing passing football, though obviously not in England, but even footage of Spanish football at that time, the pitches are often very, very muddy. They're not surfaces that you're going to be knocking the ball around on easily. It's very difficult. It was very difficult just to, to control the ball. Even, even if you were running with the ball, those wingers, you are you see the those those runs and the and the, the ball is pumping all, all the time. He's they are literally controlling the ball at each step which makes it very difficult. That's something that when you talk about, when you see modern or, 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 or contemporary football, it's something that we gained and that, that's not going to, we're not going back. The, the pitches are perfect and that changed change a lot. We can play faster. We are not, uh, we're not having trouble to, to control the ball. Obviously the, the, the players are, uh, very skilled now nowadays, but the conditions are are very very good for them. Yeah, we're talking about a very different era. Absolutely. Yeah. Paul, what else stands out for you as far as the performances? Well, I think as we we've said, the the, the results are really good. It's it's a very tough group, and we've spoken before from the perspective of the other nations that. These qualifying campaigns are, are so competitive that there's only one spot to qualify for the finals, only eight teams in the final. So every game's crucial, every point. And even though it looks like possibly a point dropped in the Republic of Ireland, those 
even the winds in Malta and Iceland are, are crucial as well because they could easily be dropped points. And as we know, that's going to be crucial at the end. And I think although they're very much overshadowed by what's happened th this century, Spain had a really consistent qualifying record for, for a long time. I think only West Germany were at every major finals of the of the 80s with Spain, all the European Championships and World Cups. Uh, it's a very consistent qualifying record. And this this is maybe one of the toughest campaigns of all with the um, nations that they're in with. So the, the results are, are, are really good. And there's obviously, as we've discussed, a lot of rebuilding at the same time without the luxury of trying players out in friendly matches. So I think it's a pretty impressive start. Yes, I, I mean, as you said, every point, every goal counted in this in this group, and uh, that's why when we were talking about the wins in Iceland, the win in um, in Malta, yes, those were two points, but the winning by one goal maybe was not enough because we knew that at some point somebody, maybe Ireland, maybe the Dutch, were going just to blow up Malta, and then the the goal difference was going to be a, an issue and it was as we as as we know what we are going to to see next year and in fact the dutch dropped the point at iceland i believe if i'm not mistaken i think that was their undoing in the end yes and because there was not much to separate uh, the two teams they were both excellent sides as far as the qualifying but uh yeah it's these little differences for next season, we'll get to that very famous 12-1 match with Malta that to this day is talked about and very memorable season for Spain next season. At this point, as good as Spain did, I don't think many would have bet this team to reach the final of the Euros, but they had clearly improved from their performances from the World Cup. Yeah, that was the the positive the positive outtake from this first season after after the World Cup, first season under Munoz. Uh, at the beginning of the next season, we have a, a friendly against France, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, yes. Spain October. To, yeah, gets gets a one one draw, and we still think well, we're not going to get all the way to the to the final because that's that's the way we think in in, in Spain. But the improvement was being seen for the last uh, for the last year. The we had a set team who played in a certain way, maybe not the most beautiful one, but uh, they were getting the the results, and that's as you said, and that's something that is already better than than what we had before. <laughs> for our next podcast, we'll discuss this next season that will culminate with the 1984 Euro finals. Once again, we'd like to thank Mr. Villarino Ferreiro for his participation in this series. As always, feel free to leave questions and comments. For any questions or comments, you may contact me on my blog and Facebook under Soccer Nostalgia on Twitter, I'm at SP1873. Mr. Paul Will can be contacted at Twitter at 1888 letter, and his blog is the 1888 letter. You may also follow the podcast on Spotify under Soccer Nostalgia Talk Podcast. Mr. Villarino can be contacted on Twitter at S Villarino. And there's also a link to his book, Mexico Setenta, that we discussed earlier. Sergio, thank you very much. My pleasure. Looking forward to the next season. We'll see, we'll see you next season. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.